Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone joining us from different parts of the world. I'm Shreya Atri. I'm an associate professor in international human rights law at the University of Oxford. And on behalf of the Bonavero Institute of Human Rights and our director, Professor Kato Regan, it is my greatest pleasure to welcome you all to the annual Eric Parent Law Lecture. This lecture is very special to us at Bonavero. It is special first and foremost because we get to co-host it with the Journal of Media Law, a partnership we value hugely given our shared commitment to issues of freedom of speech and expression. The lecture also forms part of the Monroe E. Price Media Moot Court competition, which brings together students from universities around the world to reflect on these issues. A very warm welcome to students and judges joining us today who are part of this year's competition and also those who've joined us for the moot in the past. The lecture is also special given its ethos of commitment to media law and is hence befittingly named after none other than Eric Barrent, who's dedicated his life to issues of freedom of speech and expression. And I believe he's in attendance today. Thank you, Eric, for joining us. And finally, it is only fitting that this lecture today is going to be delivered by Vicky C. Jackson, whose contribution to this field today is immeasurable. We're honored and excited to have you, Vicky, and to hear from you today. My job now is to introduce you to your host for today, Jacob Robotten, who will be introducing Vicky, our speaker. Jake is a professor of law at Oxford Law Faculty and a fellow of University College at Oxford. Jake's own research is in media law, freedom of expression, and the legal regulation of the democratic press. Jake is also an editor of the Journal of Media Law. Jake, welcome to you. Thank you for hosting today's lecture, and I hand over the proceedings to you. Okay, Shreya, thank you so much for that. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone here to the Eric Brent Media Law Lecture as well. As Shreya was saying, it's co-hosted by the Bonavero Institute and the Journal of Media Law, and it's one of the events that's associated with the Price Moot Court. And this lecture celebrates the work of Professor Eric Barrett. So as we all know, Eric is one of the leading figures in the field. He's been one of the first legal academics in the UK to really focus on freedom of speech and media law. And as you know, he started his career here in Oxford at St. Catherine's College, and then in 1990 moved to UCL, where he became the Goodman Professor of Media Law. And during this time, he published widely, including his well-known leading book on freedom of speech, which is in its second edition. He also published a monograph on broadcasting law, as well as a book on constitutional law, which I think is important for today's purposes because it highlights this link between constitutional law and media law, which we'll be hearing about later. I should also note that Eric has remained incredibly prolific in retirement, where he's continued to publish lots of articles. He's published monographs on academic freedom, anonymous speech, a casebook on media law. And in 2009, he also co-founded the Journal of Media Law, along with Rachel Crawford Smith and Tom Gibbons. Now, over the years, Eric has mentored and supported many academics that are now working in the field, uh, both in the UK and in other jurisdictions. And he's been a huge influence on media law. He's really shaped the discipline here. So we all owe Eric a huge intellectual debt. Now, in previous years for this lecture, we've been really lucky. We've had Munro Price and Damien Tambini deliver the lecture, who both have very close links with the Price Moot Court. And this year, I'm really pleased to be welcoming another distinguished scholar, Professor Vicky Jackson. Professor Jackson is the Lawrence Tribe Professor of Constitutional Law at Harvard Law School and previously taught at Georgetown University. She is an expert on constitutional law, both in the US and comparative constitutional law, and also an expert on the federal courts. And after today, I'm very much hoping she'll be adding media law to her list of expertise as well. She's published more books and articles in leading journals than I could possibly um, refer to now, but a couple of notable examples are the books Constitutional Engagement in a Transnational Era from 2010 and the book Comparative Constitutional Law from 2014. 
Now, as I mentioned earlier with Eric's work as well, there is a close link between constitutional law and media law. And one strand of Professor Jackson's work has been to look at the role of those institutions that produce and disseminate knowledge that is essential in a well-functioning democracy. And today's lecture is going to build on that, specifically looking at the role of the media. So the title for today's lecture is Knowledge Institutions in Constitutional Democracies, Reflections on the Press. Now, at the end of the lecture, hopefully we'll have time to take some questions. So if you have any questions for Professor Jackson, please do post them in the Q&A box on Zoom there. But without any further delay, please join me in giving a warm welcome to this year's lecturer, Professor Vicky Jackson. Vicky. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Jake. My thanks to the Bonavera Institute and all of the associated institutes and organizations for the opportunity to discuss the press's role as a knowledge institution in constitutional democracy. Professor Eric Barrent, for whom this lecture is named, has done such important work on speech-related freedoms, including for the press and for universities. And I'm quite honored to be invited to deliver this lecture. Let me introduce the topic. Over the last several years, democracy has been in decline. The numbers of free and democratic countries are diminishing. Of those that remain free, a significant number are suffering democratic erosion, including the United States. The Varieties of Democracy Institute in Sweden documents how misinformation is being used in the autocratization of formerly democratic societies. Nancy Bermeo uses the term democratic backsliding. Tom Ginsburg and Aziz Hook refer to democratic retrogression, describing how rising authoritarians attack three pillars of constitutional democracies, competitive and fair elections, a free and open civil society, including the press and universities and NGOs, and the rule of law in courts and in bureaucracies. Bermeo and Kim Shapley have shown how rulers now use the forms of law in bad faith as tools to undermine constitutional rule of law democracy. In this same period, the very idea of knowledge that there are verifiable facts in the world has come under sustained challenge. It was 2005 when Stephen Colbert, a US-based comedian and political commentator, coined the term truthiness, which according to Oxford's Google Dictionary means the quality of seeming or being felt to be true, even if not necessarily so. This semi-humorous description of an increased willingness by people in public life to make truth claims that are unfounded foreshadowed a more serious development, the willingness of political leaders to assert outright falsehoods, notwithstanding the certainty that their claims would be subject to immediate public checking and disverification. Such leaders were apparently confident that by virtue of their saying it, some substantial part of the public would accept their false claims. Russia lies about its deadly war on Ukraine. The U.S. still reaps fallout from lies denying Biden's 2020 victory, including several deaths caused by the invasion of the Capitol building last January. I'll remind you of two less dramatic examples. In 2017, President Trump's press secretary, Sean Spicer, made verifiably false claims about the size of the crowd at his inauguration. President Trump then excoriated journalists who pointed out photographic evidence that contradicted those claims. And Trump's counselor, Kellyanne Conway, infamously defended Spicer's claims as, and I quote, alternative facts. Two years later in 2019, President Trump made a patently incorrect claim about the likely path of Hurricane Dorian. The US National Weather Service had predicted it would hit the coastal states from North Carolina to Florida. The president added that it would also likely hit Alabama, which is not on the East Coast and had not been included in any of the likely forecasted paths. When the Birmingham, Alabama branch of the National Weather Service issued a statement that the hurricane would not hit Alabama, the president doubled down on his claim with what Stephen Skaronic and his co-authors call an obviously doctored forecast map. Someone had drawn with a Sharpie over the National Weather Service map, giving rise to the description Sharpie Gate. The president's appointees, instead of saying that the president had made a mistake, 
sought to further convey inaccurate information while suggesting that the Weather Service scientists were acting to embarrass Trump rather than to inform the public. Many of the events of this controversy were reported on by CNN, the New York Times, The Guardian, and other news sources. As Skaronik et al. wrote, the president's assault was so absurd as to defy satire. This dispute over a hurricane forecast would seem far removed from contentious issues of policy. A key point here is that the president felt emboldened to make such an unsupported assertion in a scientific field and that his aides and the highest appointee in the Commerce Department acquiesced to efforts to promote this false claim. Now, I don't mean to suggest that the phenomena of public leaders lying or making misstatements about the truth is new. It is not. But what is startling is the willingness to lie about small things readily subject to factual verification, as if to test the loyalty of followers by daring them to call out a bald-faced lie as such and for the lie to have no adverse effects on reputation or following. At the same time, public surveys reveal that positive public attitudes towards both higher education and the press are in marked decline. In 2013, 70% of the American public thought a university education was valuable and highly important. Only 51% held this view six years later. Similar trends exist for the national news media in the US. According to the Pew Foundation, in just five years, the percentage of Republicans with at least some trust in national news organizations has been cut in half, dropping from 70% in 2016 to 35% in 2021. Gallup's annual polls on confidence in institutions likewise show significant declines in those expressing trust in newspapers, and an even sharper decline in trust of TV news. Journalists finally in many countries have been violently attacked, in some cases with the encouragement or participation of governments and with perpetrators often left at large. In 2020, an unprecedented number of violent attacks on journalists occurred in the United States, mostly by police, over 400. Worldwide, since 1992, over 1,400 journalists have been killed because of their journalistic activity. In recent days, at least four journalists have been killed in Ukraine and many have fled Russia. These phenomena, attacks on elections, on independent organs of governance, including the judiciary, on civil society, on journalists and news media, attacks on the very idea of truth are all connected. Constitutional democracies need a secure democratic base a fair political competition in an informed electorate. Constitutional democracies require an open society with speech and associational rights strongly protected to allow for pluralism and sources of knowledge and opinion through NGOs, universities, and media. Constitutional democracies need a secure base in the rule of law, protecting the rules set in advance, whether for determining elections, enacting and applying laws, or at the same time, protecting individual rights. And constitutional democracies need competent governance based on knowledge of actual conditions. When governance is ineffective, both individual rights and democratic competition may be threatened by the rise of autocratic leaders. For all these reasons, some shared appreciation of knowledge is central to the success of constitutional democracies. Without a shared commitment to basing decisions on facts, important guardrails against abuse are lost. And we need the institutions that produce and disseminate knowledge to help maintain those guardrails. That's my overarching argument, that knowledge institutions, of which the press is a part, are essential to constitutional democracy. Now, by knowledge institutions, I refer to ongoing entities with a central purpose to produce or disseminate knowledge. And by this, I mean real facts or better understandings of the world and do so through the independent application of disciplinary criteria aimed at the search for truth. Knowledge institutions include at least universities, the press, and some offices in the executive part of government. Knowledge institutions are not a fourth branch, but they are an essential component of the infrastructure of constitutional democracy. In the remarks that follow, I develop four themes. First, that knowledge institutions, in addition to individual rights, 
matter for constitutionalism. Second, that knowledge institutions, including the press, are interdependent on each other. Third, that the press is a knowledge institution and as such deserves recognition and protection. Fourth, and contrary to the suggestions of some US jurists, the press can be defined reasonably, although perhaps defined differently for different purposes. Now, why do knowledge institutions matter? If we have strong rights for all persons, why should constitutionalists worry about institutions, whether of the press or universities or in government? Strong rights for freedom of expression, freedom of research and academic freedoms are absolutely vital. But the presence of knowledge institutions helps to secure those rights in ways that individual adjudications do not, by providing focal points for organized action, by reinforcing disciplinary norms of independence and knowledge seeking, and by helping to protect their members' exercise of freedoms relevant to their work. On focal points, in extensive research, Adam Chilton and Mila Versteeg discovered that the presence in written constitutions of rights held or exercised by collectivities, religious groups, trade unions or political parties were associated with higher levels of respect for those rights. In contrast, the presence of other written rights like free speech or freedom from torture, typically asserted by individuals, were not so associated. Chilton and Versteeg argued that the presence of written rights exercisable by collectivities can provide focal points for organized action like protests that may, without resort to courts, result in rights protection. That is, organizations help focus collective action to secure rights whose exercise is associated with the organization's functions. There's no reason to think this would not be true for institutional knowledge producers like the press or universities. Second, on how you institutions reinforce disciplinary cultures, we know from fields like organizational sociology that organizations develop and pass on distinctive cultures, including shared assumptions and behaviors. Institutions help sustain their cultures by teaching those assumptions to new members through a range of mechanisms, some educative, some involving imitation of the behavior of others in the community, as well as reward structures, mission statements, and codes of ethics. Journalists, like university faculties, have developed over time a set of basic assumptions that are taught to new members as the correct way to proceed. The passing on of values and practices of knowledge seeking and independence to new generations are an important part of the culture of the press. Illustrative is the New York Times recent creation of a department titled Newsroom Cultures and Careers announced in late 2021. So institutions matter because they reinforce workplace cultures. Finally, institutions matter because they protect the rights of their members who produce knowledge in accordance with the relevant disciplinary norms. This protection takes two forms. First, an organization will typically have more resources like money or legal expertise to defend the rights of their members related to the organization's mission. Although the financial challenges to the press are well known, most of the press is not as well resourced as a, as a New York Times or a Guardian or the Wall Street Journal, news companies are still likely to have more resources at their command than any individual individual journalists. As Lee Bollinger, who is a First Amendment scholar, has written, for the press to flourish, it must be an institution and it must have a culture of journalism as a profession. Second, compliance with institutional norms of a knowledge institution may, as a legal matter, help insulate their publications from liability. In defamation actions in the United States, for example, courts have indicated that journalists' compliance with editorial norms can help establish the absence of legal malice, which is an element required for defamation action uh, by a public figure. In the UK, <coughs> the statutory public interest defense to defamation turns on whether the defendant reasonably believed that publishing the statement complained of was in the public interest, a question on which, it says, the court must make allowance for editorial judgment. UK case law has noted the degree to which professional practices in journalism, like note-taking, have occurred in evaluating the reasonableness of a belief that publication was in the public interest. 
Similar phenomena have been noted in Canada, where defensive justification in one case was disallowed, as Jan Bauer wrote, when the reporter had failed to check the reliability of his source and the editor had failed to check the facts and screen the story for bias. To remind us of the larger point, following their news company's standard editorial practices may help shelter journalists' work from liability. Departure from those practices may leave them liable. Being embedded in an institutional press setting then can help provide legal protections from claims of injury to others, while also perhaps contributing to the exercise of responsible journalism. For all these reasons, the press, together with other knowledge institutions, warrants special attention in the study of constitutionalism. Now, let me turn to interdependence. Scholars and judges have emphasized several vital roles of the press in a democracy, checking the government, informing the public of matters on relevant to public affairs, providing a forum for exchange of views, and influencing the agenda of public entities. All of these functions are important, although some now may also be achieved through social media and blogs. Relatively less attention has been given to the role of the press in sustaining the broader knowledge infrastructure. In addition to being a watchdog, a discourse facilitator, a public information transmitter, and an agenda influencer, the press helps provide information that other knowledge institutions in academia and government can use to further their research and policy and also helps disseminate knowledge produced by scholars and government offices to the broader public. So law review articles uh, frequently refer to news reports. A small data point, a Westlaw search conducted on March 15th of the Harvard Law Review, which is a leading review in the US, for the period from 2000 to the present revealed 924 articles citing to the New York Times, almost as many as there were during the same time period citing to the Yale Law Journal, 980. Investigative journalists like Matt Drange have sometimes obtained valuable data that academic researchers were not able to acquire. Journalists may know how to cultivate sources better than academics. And investigations spearheaded by journalists like Jerry Mitchell have led to government investigations resulting in the convictions, decades later, of several persons who had killed voting rights activists in southern states in the 1960s. Likewise, the press is dependent on other knowledge institutions, including universities and government offices. The New York Times, for example, frequently reports on data from government statistical offices like the Justice Department's Bureau of Justice Statistics. And journalists read and benefit from and then help diffuse other scholarly work to broader publics. In all these respects, then, the press is also constitutionally valuable because of its links to other parts of the knowledge infrastructure. Now, my discussion to this point has simply assumed that the press is a knowledge institution. Yet many, including some here, probably would disagree or would question whether the institutional press should be regarded as different from other business entities. Some question whether journalists should or can be distinguished in constitutional law from other speakers. Yet the press, I say, in its ongoing institutional form is a knowledge institution that plays a role distinct from other business entities. Yes, quality journalism is under challenge. From economic and technological developments, including social media, which benefit financially from the circulation of news that they don't have to invest in producing. From governments who desire secrecy or worse outlets for propaganda. And from powerful corporations that now own so many news outlets. These challenges, I think, only emphasize the value of press institutions as part of the infrastructure of democratic constitutionalism. To begin with, the role of the press is widely recognized in formal constitutional texts. Over half of the 193 country constitutions in the Constitute Project database include explicit recognition and protection for the press, often in addition to express protection for freedom of speech. Of course, formal texts do not necessarily correspond with protection on the ground, but the inclusion in a large number of constitutions of guarantees of press freedoms suggests the perceived and distinctive importance of the press to a well-functioning constitution. So is the press a knowledge institution? Recall the three criteria 
for defining knowledge institutions. First, an ongoing entity. Second, one of their central purposes is the production or dissemination of knowledge. Finally, to do so through the independent application of disciplinary norms. Now, clearly many of the organizations make, that make up the press are ongoing entities, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, Guardian, BBC, ProPublica, uh, the Center for Investigative Reporting, or the Texas Observer. Many websites and news aggregators likewise have an ongoing organizational presence like Huff, HuffPost or Business Insider. These organizations also typically have responsible leaders or founding organizations. Even Wikipedia explains that it's a project of the Wikimedia Foundation, whose leadership is identified online. But are all these ongoing entities oriented to producing or disseminating knowledge? This is an essential criteria in defining a knowledge institution, that one of its central purposes is producing or disseminating knowledge. And that is surely a principal purpose of the press, epitomized by the New York Times mission statement. Our mission is simple. We seek the truth and help people understand the world. Its ethical journalism standards say, in print and online, we tell our readers the complete unvarnished truth as best we can learn it. Similar emphasis on accuracy and truth seeking is found in other news media codes of conduct, including the, in the UK, IPSO and IMPRESS codes, uh, and in broadcast media. The BBC's code of conduct, for example, says our journalism is as true, accurate, and impartial as we can make it, continue the quote, based on credible evidence from credible sources. Now, the aspiration to accuracy and reporting, to truth-telling, is not limited to the press in any one part of the world. The International Federation of Journalists, an organization that says it has offices in Africa, Asia, and the Pacific, Latin America, and the Middle East, has a global charter of ethics. This charter describes as, quote, the first duty of the journalist to respect the facts and the right of the public to truth. It also states that journalists must do their utmost to rectify any errors or published inaccuracies in a timely, explicit, complete, and transparent manner. That the press does not always succeed in identifying the truth. That it is sometimes too scoop-focused or may be seeking the veneer of objectivity through carelessly equating authoritative and uninformed views does not detract from its having as a central purpose the discovery or dissemination of truth. The truth reported in daily journalism may be quite contingent. The so-called first draft of history description contemplates further revisions. There will likely be more errors in current daily reporting than in describing the conclusions of a multi-year academic study. But it's a signal feature of journalistic ethics codes around the world to aim for accuracy in the reporting of facts and distinguishing facts from commentary. If the organization's object is not to get out the facts, real facts here is what I mean, not alternative facts, it should not be regarded as a press knowledge institution, although it may play a role in free democratic debate. A final element distinguishing knowledge institutions from other communicators lies in the reliability constraints adhered to by the community of actors within the institution. The reputable press around the world is committed not only to verification of information before it is printed and correction thereafter as needed, but also to independence from entangling commitments with those they cover. <clears throat> For the Society of Professional Journalists, a broad-based U.S. journalism association, a basic precept is that journalists must take responsibility for the accuracy of their reporting and verify information before they report it. Reporters engage in verification when they seek multiple witnesses to the same event or when they seek to confirm in public records aspects of what a confidential source has said. Ethics codes urge journalists to be mindful of self-interested motives by those who supply information. They suggest that sources should be identified except when promised anonymity, and that such promises should be given rarely, only for sources who face danger or retribution and have information not otherwise obtainable. Ethics codes also suggest that subjects of reporting should be allowed to respond to claims about them before they're published. The New York Times has said, 
The information in a news story should never be a surprise to the subjects because a journalist should confront them with allegations and information. The Washington Post likewise indicates that its commitment to fairness implies giving the subject of a story the prior opportunity to address assertions about them. Some ethics codes even specify the kind and quantity of evidence needed to support controversial statements. The public broadcasting system in the US uh, has standards for accuracy that say as a general rule, at least two authoritative independent sources should be on the record before controversial assertions are distributed by PBS. In addition to disciplinary norms promoting accuracy, knowledge institutions must apply those norms with independence. Many news organizations have rules designed to preserve independence from entities or persons that the journalist covers. The New York Times, in the interest of maintaining what it calls the paper's neutrality, prohibits staff from accepting gifts, reimbursement, employment, or other inducements from any individuals or organizations covered by the Times or likely to be covered by the Times. The Washington Post has similar conflict uh, policies. We pay our own way, it says. We accept no gifts from news sources. We accept no free trips and so forth. At the BBC, editorial integrity and independence is defined to mean that reporting is not influenced by outsider personal interests and is implemented by required annual conflicts of interest checks and disclosures requirements. The attention to journalistic verification and to maintaining independence from those covered are aspirations towards the kind of disciplinary autonomy that more generally characterize knowledge institutions. All right, now let me turn, <coughs> apologies, I have a little cold. Now let me turn to the view frequently expressed in the United States that notwithstanding a separate press clause in the First Amendment, it is simply too difficult to define the press, a view sometimes offered as if it were an unanswerable objection to recognizing any special status for the press. Now, this may be simply an aspect of current US First Amendment exceptionalism that prohibits prior restraints, that treats campaign expenditures as speech, and that views hate speech bans as suspect forms of content or viewpoint regulation. But the issue is hopefully of broader interest. Although members of the US Supreme Court have expressed different views on the subject, for the moment, the court has rejected a view of the press clause as supplying special rights for the press and has expressed skepticism that news businesses can be meaningfully distinguished from others for purposes of constitutional rights claims. The Citizens United case in 2010 invalidated a statute limiting corporate and union general treasury expenditures on electioneering while also indicating that an exemption from the electioneering restrictions for media companies, news stories, commentaries, and editorials impermissibly favored selected speakers. Rejecting the proposition that the institutional press has any constitutional privilege beyond that of other speakers, the court emphasized that the First Amendment's mistrust of governmental power prohibits restrictions distinguishing among different speakers. This and other cases leave open worrisome prospects that the court might invalidate statutory privileges to identified press entities, even if the basis for their selection is not their content. In an earlier case, Chief Justice Berger wrote about the difficulty and he said perhaps impossibility of distinguishing either as a matter of fact or constitutional law, media corporations from other corporations. Not only was such a task difficult, but he wrote, the very task of including some entities within the institutional press while excluding others, whether undertaken by legislature, court, or administrative agency is reminiscent of the abhorred licensing system of, with apologies, Tudor and Stewart England. A contrary view, though, about the U.S. press clause was expressed by Justice Stewart, who believed, as do many scholars, that the First Amendment does protect the press as an institution as part of a more general constitutional strategy of establishing checks on government. Now, my target here is the claim of the impossibility and impermissibility of drawing distinctions among speakers uh, with the press in mind. All right, now some may think that whatever was the case 50 years ago, the press today no longer 
has a distinct institutional shape. It has expanded since the digital revolution and arguably includes millions of individual citizen journalists and thousands of blogs and blogs. Scholars are divided. Some argue that anyone can engage in journalistic activity from the lonely pamphleteer, pamphleteer to national news outlets. Some say bloggers should be treated as journalists because it is no longer appropriate to define journalism and journalists by reference to some recognized body of training or affiliation with a news entity or professional body. In the UK, I note the public interest defense of the Defamation Act 2013 is not by terms limited to journalists. Now, citizen journalists, blogs, blogs deserve ample protection of their speech, but they do not simply by virtue of the content of their speech necessarily fulfill the functions of a press institution, an ongoing organization that aspires to accurate reporting and applies disciplinary methods to do so. The task of defining the institutional press or for that matter of defining journalism seems to me no more difficult than other challenging questions in constitutional law, like what constitutes a church or a religion. Despite Citizens United's suggestion that the First Amendment does not allow distinctions among speakers, there's a lot of existing law recognizing such distinctions and acknowledging the special role of the press in sustaining democratic constitutionalism. That role, and today I would say especially the watchdog and informative roles of the press, may well justify special protection. The U.S. court has previously upheld lower postal rates for newspapers, for example. Other scholars describe areas of statutory law, dubbed by one scholar as majoritarian free speech protections, statutes in which the press is provided with rights, privileges, and protections not granted other speakers, including testimonial privileges, enhanced protection from searches and seizures, special access to government-controlled information or meetings, reduced fees, and exemption from antitrust regulation, as well as some taxes. In the UK, Journalistic expression is explicitly given heightened protection in the Human Rights Act 1998, which goes beyond the text of Article 10 of the European Convention. On defamation, both the Reynolds Common Law Defense of Responsible Journalism and the Defamation Act 2013, which, as mentioned, invites courts to make allowance for editorial judgment, both invite attention to sound journalistic practices. Although neither depended on the defendant being part of a press institution, a defendant's conduct as part of an institutional press might bear on whether the defendant could reasonably have regarded publishing the statement as being in the public interest. If the journalist and publication comply with internal editorial norms, those facts would bear positively on the reasonableness of their belief. And the 10 Reynolds criteria, I understand not a checklist, not a checklist, not incorporated in, but bearing on the statutory public interest defense, embraces factors frequently addressed in journalistic codes of ethics. For example, what steps were taken to verify the information and whether the party claiming to be defamed had had a prior opportunity to comment. In this way, the institutional press's norms influence the content of more general rules of law. Now, the challenges of identifying press organizations, I suggested, is comparable to challenges presented in defining other organizations, and here I'm thinking universities or churches, that require some autonomy to enable constitutionally protected activity to take place. The U.S. Constitution nowhere refers to universities or academic freedom as such. Nonetheless, academic freedoms associated with universities as institutions have been found implicit in the First Amendment. No specific text was needed for Felix Frankfurter to describe the four academic freedoms of universities essential to the quest for knowledge and to retaining a free society. He understood the special constitutional role that universities play in checking conventional beliefs and government truth claims. Decades later, Justice Souter could observe that the U.S. has long recognized the constitutional importance of academic freedom, which includes not merely liberty from restraints on thought or expression in the academy, but also universities' freedoms to make decisions about how and what to teach. By analogy, structural reasoning from commitments to representative democracy would imply that the press as an institution 
like universities, requires protection, even without a press clause. Reasoning from constitutional structure to rights exists in Australia, where an implied freedom of political communication was derived from provisions for representative self-government. In the US, Charles Black argued that many constitutional decisions attributed to particular texts would be the same even without that text, given the basic structure of representative government. On New York Times against Sullivan, for example, he argued, to allow a jury to impose liability for criticism of a state official for his constitutional defaults would be inconsistent with the basic premises on which free government rests. Like the press, religion is mentioned in the US Constitution, which guarantees freedom of religion and prohibits establishments of religion. This text requires the legal system to grapple with definitional questions, some of which are analogous to definitional issues for the press, including the need not to discriminate based on content. The US court has veered between defining religion relatively more narrowly and relatively more broadly. Issues have also arisen over the scope and validity of exemptions from general laws for religions, like the news media exemption in Citizens United. Courts have had to define churches or religion while not entangling themselves in religious doctrine, and they've sought to do so with care. Many churches seek favorable tax treatment under the Internal Revenue Code by meeting requirements that a nonprofit organization exists exclusively for religious purposes. The Internal Revenue Service has not offered a definitive definition, but rather has articulated 14 factors to be considered in deciding whether to grant the exemption. Two points emerge. <clears throat> First, institutions central to constitutionalism and the exercise of rights, like universities and the press, may find constitutional protection even if the institution is not named as such. Second, defining the objects of constitutional protection without impairing the goal of that protection is a problem not unique to the press and might well be served by multi-factor approaches rather than by a single rule. In sum, the suggestions that the press has no special constitutional status or that it would be impossible to define the press are not persuasive. As Professor Sonia West has argued, the press and the news organizations that constitute the press can be distinguished from what she calls occasional public commentators by several distinct qualities, including the press's often specialized knowledge about the subject matter at issue, uh, <clears throat> its gatekeeping function by making editorial decisions about what is or is not newsworthy, its ability to place news stories in context and convey important information in a timely manner, its resources, professional ethics, and accountability to an ability to reach a public audience. The possibility of defining the press and distinguishing it from others who may engage in journalistic activity is also suggested by a range of other regulatory approaches. For example, in the US, the federal securities law has defined the press for purposes of a safe harbor provision for press interviewers of an issuer of securities. An interview consistent with the registration statement is permissible as long as it's published by an unaffiliated media company and is then filed with the SEC. An unaffiliated media company is defined as the publisher of a bona fide newspaper, magazine, or business or financial publication of general and regular circulation or a bona fide broadcaster of news with established policies and procedures for the independence of the content of that publication or broadcast from the offering activities of the issuer and that is published or broadcasted in the ordinary course. Uh, press passes to key government sites are often restricted to members of the institutional press. In the U.S. Congress, the House rules for credentialing members of the press gallery require that they be bona fide resident correspondents of reputable standing, giving their chief attention to the gathering and reporting of news, who are employed by periodicals that regularly publish a substantial volume of news material, which periodical requires that Washington coverage on a continuing basis and is owned and operated independently of any government, industry, institution, or lobbying organization. 
Now, this definition does not separately require commitments to accuracy or verification, but it does require employment by a regularly publishing periodical operated independently of the government. And being part of the press gallery and uh, allows correspondents to have guest privileges in the speaker's lobby for the purpose of interviews. Uh, the White House and the U.S. Supreme Court likewise distinguish members of the institutional press from others in their rules for press access. The White House press corps definition excludes those not regularly employed by a news gathering organization that regularly reports on the White House. And the Supreme Court allocates its limited available space primarily to quote, full-time professional journalists. Uh, a similar approach to press, to press credentials is taken in the UK in the parliamentary press passes, which, as I understand it, are, quote, designed for those journalists required by their outlet to cover the UK parliament and political scene on a regular basis. As such approaches suggest, the institutional press can reasonably be seen to differ from the wide range of entities and individuals that may engage in some form of journalistic activity and in ways that correspond with the institutional press's advantages in playing key press roles, especially that of being government watchdog and disseminator of knowledge to the general public. Drawing from existing laws and scholarly work, here are four criteria that might help distinguish the institutional press from the broader ambit of journalistic activity. First, the institutional press has a fixed identity and ongoing presence, a regular publication and audience, which allow for accountability of its leadership and go to the incentives of those writing to maintain the organization's reputation for accuracy and integrity. Second, the institutional press has a depth of resources, knowledge, and expertise from its members' experience as professional journalists. Third, the institutional press typically makes a commitment to professional norms of ethical journalism, accuracy, verification of information reported, and independence from the subjects being covered, whether through membership in professional societies or the adoption of an internal code of ethics. Finally, the institutional press typically has editors who, as a regular part of the publication process, check individual reporters' judgments, offering some assurance that the independence and verification aspects of good journalism are in force. Institutions with these characteristics are likely to function as knowledge institutions. Now, this is but a tentative and very rough effort towards showing the possibility of drawing reasonable uh, standards to define press institutions without relying on suspect content bases that would be inconsistent with the goals of a free press. Now, a range of legal exemptions from otherwise applicable laws further suggest that the press or more broadly journalists are capable of being reasonably defined. Codes of ethics exhort journalists to protect their confidential sources. Although not yet clearly embraced by the US Supreme Court, a number of lower federal courts in the US have recognized some privilege for journalists to protect notes or sources from subpoena. In one circuit, for example, the privilege is available if the person subpoena is engaged in investigative reporting and news gathering and second, possesses the intent at the inception of the news gathering process to disseminate the news to the public. Although such criteria could in theory be invoked by citizen journalists, some US state legislatures have taken a different approach, creating statutory privileges for professional journalists to avoid disclosing confidential sources and protect uh, journalistic work papers. These laws for the most part apply to those employed by news media. In California, for example, the privilege extends only to persons, I quote, connected with or employed by a newspaper, magazine, or other periodical publication, or by a press association or wire service. In Maryland, the privilege is limited to either those employed by news media in news gathering or news disseminating, or independent contractors for news media acting within the scope of a contract to gather or disseminate news, or university students engaged in news gathering recognized by their school as an academic activity or sponsored extracurricular activity. As these examples suggest, both courts and legislatures have been able to devise meaningful lines to distinguish the institutional press, or in some cases, a broader class of journalists from others without engaging in content-based distinctions. Now, with respect to special access for the institutional press to limited access government events, 
I think it's no doubt better to provide some access than no access at all to the spaces in which elected officials carry out their daily work. If not all who are interested can be accommodated, the characteristics of the institutional press, their resources, their regular reach of the public, their procedures for promoting reliability and reporting, suggest that compelling interests are served by the limitation, provided that the passes or uh, procedures are fairly applied and people are not denied a pass based on content discriminatory grounds. In this setting, the organizational status of the institutional press matters to the constitutional analysis, insofar as it provides justification for a practice based on a line drawn that on the whole advances the value of a free and democratic society. Similarly, although perhaps less compellingly, journalist shield laws might plausibly be limited to full-time journalists or those employed by news organizations. Constitutional interests in protecting the news gathering process and encouraging press disclosures of wrongdoing in high places supports a privilege, as do interests in avoiding unnecessary intrusion on journalists' work. Yet, testimonial privileges have social costs to the government's ability to successfully investigate crime, uh, and more generally to the fair administration of the laws. Limiting reporters' shields to those associated with the institutional press with its availability of editors and editorial policies that can impose reasonable limits, for example, on dealing with confidential sources, might be one sensible accommodation of those conflicting interests. In investigation is an important function of the institutional press, and one that in general cannot be played quite as well by all who would be embraced in more generous definitions of journalists as anyone who seeks to investigate matters with intent to write about them. Now, I actually remain somewhat agnostic on whether the institutional press is best protected by laws singling them out or by more generally applicable laws, and I think the answer may well vary depending on the issue. Some general doctrines will clearly especially benefit the press, including protections from for liability for defamation. Uh, the defense of reportage, for example, when recognized, which is for providing a neutral, accurate, and dispassioned reportorial account of a newsworthy event that may involve defamatory charges made by others, is far more likely to be of use to the professional institutional media than others. But my main point, at least in the US context, is that there's more room for legislatures to decide on these issues than logical extensions of the US Supreme Court's current position may allow. Now, I am coming near the end of my talk, but I just want to mention that distinctions between the institutionalized press and the broader class of citizen journalists might also be relevant in evaluating the constitutionality of subsidies directed at press organizations. Under more positive understandings of constitutionalism, governments might even be thought obligated to provide funding or subsidies for the press, especially in underserved areas. Martha Minow and others have written with concern about the development of news deserts in the United States. And repeated studies have shown a correlation between the absence of local news media and increased incidents of corruption. At the same time, too much dependence on any single source of funding may have adverse effects on press freedom in the long run. Media pluralism, a major theme of writing for at least two decades, including by Professor Berendt in his book on freedom of speech, assumes increasing urgency as trends in business consolidation and growth of social media as the source of news continues. Pluralism may require some but not too much public support and adequate protection for editorial independence, as well as roles for voluntary press associations to help sustain professional ethics. Now, some years ago, Lee Bollinger reflected on what he called a basic ambivalence in constitutional law, writing that we want both a powerful and independent press that is free to check the government, and we also want a responsible press that is subject to government regulation. Simple solutions, for example, the US court's recent assertion that the First Amendment prohibits distinctions among speakers, are unlikely to achieve the requisite balance. Constitutionalists must, I think, apply a more fine-grained contextual analysis 
mindful of the distinctive contributions of the institutional press as part of the knowledge infrastructure of constitutional democracy. Now, my argument here may have raised more questions than it answers, but I thank you for your attention, and I'm happy now to try to engage with your questions. Okay, thank you, Vicky. Thank you very much. That was great. That was, uh, we've, we've covered constitutional theory, the First Amendment, uh, UK media law, we've covered so much ground there. And I think it's been a really important defense of the institutional media's role in a democracy. Um, as you quite rightly say, there's been a lot of statements made by people and, and scholars kind of dismissive of the institutional role saying we can't define the media and everyone's a journalist. And I think you've it talk has dispelled some of those myths and pushed back against that and also helps to clarify media freedom as being a distinct right that along the lines of say academic freedom so i think it's quite right there uh, and also invites us i think to think about you know what conditions are necessary for the media to function as a knowledge institution as well i guess that's a further question now i have lots of thoughts and questions but i won't go into those let's have a look at some of the questions in the q a uh, we've got several that's been posted uh, here. Let's start with the first one where, uh, I don't know if you can see them in front of you in, in the Q&A box, but we've got the first one here saying, Professor, will it be self-defeating in a democratic society if a regulation of press is undertaken to ensure that they follow a certain code of ethics? So I guess that's raising the question of whether that's opening up the door to kind of censorship by given the role that you've stressed for following professional ethics and having those standards? I mean, is there that risk of it being self-defeating? Well, it's a, great, it's a great question because this is an area in which um, government enforcement of what are ethical norms has a great risk of turning into censorship, of turning into self-interested, efforts by those who are currently incumbent in office to suppress press efforts that might favor their opponents. So uh, it could be self-defeating, yes. Um, this may reflect my US background, but I am at the moment much more comfortable with voluntary codes of ethics, which is essentially, I think, what exists in the United States. But I think just because there isn't government enforcement does not mean that the presence of those um, ethical codes are not significant for constitutionalists. Uh, and so uh, right now, uh, at least in the US, I think my point is these codes of ethics are valuable. They're serious. Now they do um, sometimes come into play in what I would regard as a gentle, and indirect way in defamation actions, where if a journalist and the newspaper adhere to some recognized journalistic code, they are more likely to be able successfully to defend against a defamation claim. And I regard that as indirect and gentle. Um, uh, and I am, I would say, not uncomfortable with that. But that's a different matter than a licensing scheme. Uh, and uh, I would be very uncomfortable in the United States with a general licensing scheme for news media. So, I mean, it's been, I think you're quite right to say, it's one thing to say code of ethics are a condition for certain privileges. And another thing to say, those codes of ethics should be devised by the state and enforced by the state. So there's slightly different questions. It's been a big debate over here. I guess because there's questions like, well, what happens if we're unhappy with those voluntary codes? What happens if the profit orientation of the media doesn't direct it towards its function as a knowledge institution? And I guess that's part of the debate that you get in, in the UK. Yeah, well, let me just say maybe two things uh, in response, uh, uh, Jake. If critics are unhappy, with the existing codes, we have free speech. And criticism and public embarrassment and academic scrutiny uh, are important. Uh, three things, actually. Second, um, I tried at the end of my talk, mindful of 
time constraints to say a little bit about the role of media pluralism. And let me say a little bit more about that. One of the interesting things I've learned has come into existence in the United States are the development of nonprofit investigative journalism outlets. Now, one of them, I mean, the Texas Observer Reporter, I mentioned it in my talk, actually was founded in the 1950s. So I just recently have found out about it. But the Center for Investigative Journalism, uh, for example, is, is one of them. And when you have those, that kind of pluralism in ownership structure and motivation, you have sources of critique and sources of pressure. Now, there was a third thing I was going to say. Oh, corporate interests, right. So, yes, uh, I briefly mentioned in the talk, uh, ownership of major press outlet by for-profit entities and especially highly consolidated <clears throat> ownership of multiple, multiple uh, press outlets is a concern. But I guess the way I would think about it is that codes of ethics actually are a bulwark that can be relied on by journalists who have a professional ethos as a way of arguing for editorial independence from their corporate owner. And the last comment I would make is everywhere you look, there are interests that are not necessarily public interests. Even nonprofit organizations may have particular orientations or particularized conceptions of what the public interest is that others would disagree with. So yes, it's a problem, but I think the codes of ethics are actually, and the journalistic ethos, are actually a way of limiting the effects of the profit motive of you know the oil companies that don't want coverage of global warming and the like. Okay, great. Shall we? Um, we've got another question as well from it's on the it's actually from Professor Barant here, uh, where he asks, "What is the relationship of media freedom or me relationship between media freedom and freedom of speech? Which is primary?" Is media freedom important only when it serves the values of free speech? Oh my goodness. Well, I, I, I almost hesitate to answer, to even attempt to answer this question given the very distinguished and knowledgeable source. Um, I do not really want to characterize either as more important than the other. I think they're both absolutely central. Freedom of expression, I would say, has a broader set of purposes. And I, if I remember your book, Professor Berendt, I think this is consistent with what you have written. But what I think is freedom of speech has a much broader ambit of purposes than media freedom. Uh, and particularly here, I'm thinking about um, the idea of personal autonomy, finding expression in what we speak and what we think about and what we write about and, and the creation of arts uh, are not so much about preserving democracy, although they can be helpful to that end, but about assuring a sphere in which people can think and speak freely as a part of human flourishing. And that, I think, is something I would attribute to protections of freedom of speech, expression, conscience, and the like, that are much less central, if they're relevant at all, to press freedoms, although there's probably an overlap. Press freedoms, I think, are play a unique role in the ability to pull together resources to focus on the government from outside. And I think that is a somewhat distinct function than the function played by free speech, although you need a principle of free speech in order to have a free press, right? People have to be free to speak to journalists without worrying that the government will throw them in jail if they complain to the press. So um, they need each other. But without a press to watch and report on what is happening, the value of individuals' free speech will be diminished. They will not have the same knowledge base on which to carry on, through which to carry on their discourse, I think. Yeah, so it's very much following kind of the instrumental understanding of free speech 
serving the needs of the audience, providing necessary information and, and, and so on. But obviously the kind of human values at stake with free speech are less likely to be invoked with, for, with the institutional right. I guess, is that? I think that's part of it, but I was also, yes. I mean, I, I take the uh, human values as opposed to consequentialist kind of, of view, but I'm also saying that the human values um, can't be well served without the institutional inputs of knowledge institutions. So I sort of want to resist their complete separation. Right. Okay, good. Shall we look at, we got a question here from Martin as well. This is a bit more specific. What, if anything, follows from your analysis in respect of constitutional protections for comments from the public material in an online version of an institutional press newspaper? So does the does this protection carry over to comments from the public? Uh, well, first, let me say hello to Martin. It's nice to see you in the in the question uh, uh, box there. Uh, although I haven't seen you in person uh, for for quite some time, I am not sure. I'm not really sure, uh, Martin. What follows? Uh, let me see how far I can get. I'm not sure I'll get far enough to actually answer you. I think the comments section they're like letters to the editor in my conception. Um, I'm not sure that they, they obviously play an important role in the press's ability to reflect discourse and reaction. Uh, and that is an important role, one also shared now by social media. Um, the relationship of the press to the comments and letters may depend some on uh, the curating function. So I know in New York Times, I have written to it many times. Uh, I'm not sure I've gotten a letter published yet because they make editorial selections and hopefully do so with an eye towards expanding knowledge. So I would not expect the Times to publish a letter that had blatantly false information in it. Uh, I know less honestly about the ways in which the Times or others curate or don't curate comments from the public. But I think the relationship of the institutional press uh, uh, and, and how it would fit into the knowledge institutions uh, framework might well depend on how intensively curated uh, what is posted is. I think that's about all I can say. Okay. No, so it's one of the really difficult areas that, that's come up in certain cases. <clears throat> where we think so would have been cases to say, should source protection laws protect a newspaper from disclosing people who've made anonymous comments? And I guess things come, come down to, you know, it depends how much vetting, should they be able to treat them as a source or is it a direct pr protection to, you know, a direct publication to the world at large from the commenter? So the, the, these are some of the, the, the difficult issues in just trying to figure out how far the protection of press freedom goes. Um, We've got a few more um, questions. Oh, we've got that from Antonina. We've got a comment where she says, thank you for the great presentation. I think that this approach could form at least part of the response to the organized disinformation, which is in fact an abuse of media freedom. So again, I guess stressing the- Well, I, cer I certainly um, agree with that. As I tried to indicate, uh, press outlets should, parts of the institutional press should try to be aware of the, of the presence in the world of organized efforts to feed misinformation. Uh, I think I said something briefly in my talk about, you know, thinking about who's giving you information and what the motivations are. And in this digital world we live in, which makes it very easy for people to disclose or disguise the source of information, that obligation becomes uh, harder to meet and more important to meet. Um, part of the news story should be, is there an organized disinformation campaign going on? So very, very nice point. Um, we, uh, this is the next one from Irini, I think is a test for you on how well versed you are in British uh, press regulation <laughs> today. So uh, here we go. How do you feel about forcing the press to join a recognised self-regulatory body by the way of imposition of exemplary damages, as was proposed by Leveson? What this is getting at is there was a system proposed a decade ago by Lord Justice Leveson, 
And it wasn't so much saying the state should impose a code of a, a code of practice or a code of ethics, but there would be a strong in, there should be a strong incentive from the state to get uh, newspapers to join what they call a recognised self-regulatory body. So that's where it's been through, and the, the code of practice and the systems of self-regulation are deemed to meet certain benchmarks. So we just think, like, do, is that consistent? I guess with with, with your view of press freedom, or do, you, do does your perspective from the US, does that raise a some alarm bell still? So uh, I, I have a different answer depending on which hat I'm wearing. <laughs> um, so with my US constitutional law hat on, uh, this idea, um, if the recognition of the self-regulatory body comes from the government, this makes me uneasy. It it's but very much with my U.S. Uh, hat on. With a broader comparative hat on, I would think I would need to know more about um, the constitutional culture in which such a scheme gets worked out. Like how often, I, I had understood the Levison proposal, Jake, correct me if I'm wrong, I had understood it more as an exemption from exemplary damages that might otherwise under general law be imposed? Or was it that if you if you didn't join, you, you were subject to exemplary damages? It, 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 you could be subject to exemplary damages, but you'd still have to meet certain thresholds of, you know, that, that yeah. you breach the right in a certain way. I guess it was previously in privacy law, you couldn't have exempt. Sorry, this is going into the detail of UK media law, which you may not wish to know, but it, on privacy law, um, you couldn't have exemplary damages traditionally, whereas under this provision now, in theory, you can if that threshold is met. So it's low risk, but it's your potential. Well, you know, I, I think that uh, in evaluating particular schemes in particular countries, the details actually matter. I am a uh, contextually oriented uh, comparativist. And if you have the combination of liability being available for exemplary damages that was not previously, and a government body being in charge of whether you're entitled to join, um, that would make me uh, nervous, uh, anxious from a knowledge institution's free press point of view, because there wouldn't be a track record to look at as to how often exemplary damages had previously been awarded. Yeah. Um, if one had a track record, and the answer was the existing standards very rarely allowed it, I might feel differently about it as, you know, is it within the range of reasonable things for a constitutional democracy um, to do? So I'm sorry not to give a more definitive answer, but those are my two answers. One with U.S. Khan Lahat, one comparative. Right, thank you. We've got another one from Eric here. Um... <laughs> which looks like a difficult one. It's um, who can exercise or claim press freedom, the owner, editor, or individual journalist? So who is the ben who, who's, who's the right holder, I guess? Well, I'd, I'd love to know what uh, Professor Berendt thinks about this. I have not given that particular and very important question uh, enough thought to provide an answer. What I will say is that it bears a resemblance to a question that I have thought a little bit about, which arises with respect to academic freedom. And that question is, well, who holds the freedom? Is it the university? or is it the individual faculty member? Uh, there are some uh, very good scholars who argue, you know, it's really a freedom of the university. It's an institutional collectively held freedom. And others who said, well, you know, maybe, it, maybe it's actually held by both. And I, um, I am in the latter school. I think it depends on the context. Uh, I think that even, so the, the case that brings these two ideas into most tension, uh, the paradigm case in universities would be the university denies tenure. It says you have not met our standards of scholarly production. And the faculty member says, I have published in very high level journals. This is that they don't agree with my ideas. I'm not sure I want to say you always defer to the university. It seems to me that there are different elements of the freedom of being of academic freedoms entailed in that um, setting. 
that need to be dealt with in a sort of proportional way and in a somewhat fact intensive way. Um, <clears throat> so I think I would start from that of saying I'm a little bit hesitant to be pushed to say it has to be any one of the three that are proposed by Professor Berendt, that there might be circumstances in which is shared or which the interests of one of those three should predominate. Right, okay. So yeah, it depends on the particular question and the way it arises. From Damien uh, Tambini, who gave the lecture last year, he asks, um, can you speculate on a potential route to recognition of special institutional rights for the media as knowledge institutions in the US? What might test cases involve? All right, I'll give you, oh, should I answer? Is it okay? Yeah, yeah, please, yeah. yeah. Okay, so great question. I will give you two answers from current, re well, recent events. So in um, January of this year, the Iowa Senate, so Iowa is one of the American states. Uh, it's out in the Midwest. Uh, uh, it has the, well, the Iowa Senate announced that it would no longer allow journalists a space to work in the Senate chamber. This is a shift from a longstanding practice. The Iowa Senate says, well, we just can't figure out who's the press anymore. So we're just going to say everybody can go up where the general public is. So this is an example of this US discomfort with defining the press. I want to say being used here to get members of the Iowa Senate away from the kind of scrutiny that when you're on the floor of the Senate, you can provide. And it strikes me as an abridgment, to use a word from the US Constitution, of previous existing press freedom. So I don't know if any journalists are going to challenge this, but I could imagine a challenge. Um, and, uh, you know, as I mentioned, um, the US Supreme Court at the moment might be more uh, in tune with the reasons the Iowa Senate gave for kicking the press out altogether. My own view is that it's much better for the knowledge function of the of press and for democracy to let some press in if you can develop non-content based criteria for doing so, as I tried to suggest in the, in the talk. One other example from relatively current events, there was a proposal in the law, oh, what was it called? In a proposed bill that the Biden administration was supporting called, I think the Build Back Better law. Now, part of that law has been put on hold for a while, but there was a proposal introduced in November, <coughs> excuse me, in a version of the bill that was passed by the House that would have provided um, essentially a payroll tax credit for news organizations that were below a certain size in a particular location for essentially hiring journalists to do local news coverage. Now, if that provision were to pass, and knowing the litigious character of my, of my, uh, of my country, uh, I'm, I'm confident that litigation would follow from press outlets that were excluded. So for example, the New York Times um, would not have qualified for the exemption under the proposal as it existed in the House because it had too many people in one place already. Uh, and the New, the New York Times is not located in the areas that are kind of lacking news coverage the way many rural parts of the United States are. Um, but that would be a test, uh, I think another case in which you could imagine a court saying, well, you know, free press is really important. And this is a way of trying to get a free press to be more effective as a news gathering organization. Uh, on the other hand, one could also imagine courts in the United States saying, no, 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 you can't draw any distinctions here because you're making some press outlets into favored speakers. So I think either of those, excuse me, either of those situations might provide an occasion for litigation over the status of the press. 
Okay, interesting. So it really raises the point that you raised in the lecture about the, the risk of special privileges amounting to a form of licensing and yeah. that risk of could it lead to kind of content-based distinctions being made. I mean, Tom's question that follows Damien's is on a similar line, although I guess he's asking how far should, again, it's on the similar lines about how we define the press, but how far should the courts go in conducting an assessment of the democratic credentials of press organizations? So I guess, sorry. Well, that's interesting. Um, uh, democratic credentials, does, uh, that's an interesting concept, but I'm, uh, does that, I, I'm, I'm curious whether the questioner has in mind how open the organization is to being joined by different press outlets, or whether the question is whether there's internal democracy in the press organization. Uh, either of those strike me as plausible. And the answer is I haven't thought about it. It's a very interesting question um, to think about. Um, in the US cases, I have not seen, uh, well, I haven't looked exhaustively, but I don't have a basis uh, on which to further analyze this other than to say it's a very interesting question. And there are cases involving exclusion. There's an old case from 40 or 50 years ago involving a news outlet or journalist who was not admitted to the White House Press Correspondence Association. That's a private association, but at that time, at least you had to be a member of it to be considered for the White House Press Corps. I think I'm remembering this. And there were no procedures for challenging a decision not to admit someone to the White House Press Correspondence Association. And I have a very vague memory that the court, might, that a lower court might have said, well, given the public function you're playing, there has to be a due process approach. Uh, to this. I'm not sure if that's what you were getting at, but it's a really interesting question. Now, so far, I was surprised that no one had raised social media and asked where do they play, what role do they play, but we've got the next question from Alessandros um, fits within that way, saying that the UK government published last week its online safety bill, which will require citizens' posts on social media platforms to be regulated, but news publishers' websites are not in scope of online safety regulation. This has led to some criticism that individual social media accounts will be regulated more than the accounts of some publications, which may be able to take advantage of this exemption. So it's saying that we give a privilege. News organisations are less regulated than individuals who have con conversations on social media. That's one of the lines of criticism there. Uh, well... I, uh, I, am, I, I did know a couple of months ago that the UK government was considering an online safety bill. Um, I did not know of this distinction um, uh, uh, that it would be introducing between citizens' posts there and elsewhere. And um, so I don't have a well-formulated thought about this, but what I I do want to say that I think would inform my thinking about it down the road uh, is something else that uh, Lee Bollinger, I referred to him before, he's a very smart guy. He's president of Columbia University. So in that capacity, I think he sits on the Pulitzer Committee uh, and he's written some terrific books on free speech. And in one of them, he was talking about the <clears throat> distinction in US law between broadcast media and print media. And the, the, some of the distinction used to be based on sort of scarcity of broadcast media, which uh, is a rationale that doesn't have very much traction anymore. But he made a very interesting point. And, and his point was something like this, that there may be some benefit in having different regulatory schemes for different kind of media outlets. Just because it's awfully hard to be sure that any particular approach, you know, within boundaries, is going to yield the best balance between promoting robust conversation and sharing of ideas and thoughts on the one hand, and on the other hand, avoiding, you know, the kind of um, 
uh, hateful, bullying, targeted harassment that, that sometimes appears. And so in reflecting on your very good question, I think I would be starting from some notion that one doesn't need necessarily to have the same regulatory approach for different kinds of media. I think that's very much the thinking behind the exemption, because I think that the, the, the argument is that the, the exempted news organisations will be regulated somewhere else. Not that they're completely unregulated, but they'll have their codes of ethics, their self-regulatory schemes. Now, whether we buy that depends on how convinced you are that those self-regulatory schemes are working well. But it is the idea of having different regulatory regimes for different types of activity. Yeah, and you know, one thing I, I don't know enough about UK law to know if this is the case, but in the US, there is um, a special statutory provision that has the effect essentially of immunizing the internet service providers from defamation liability. Um, if they, you know, something is posted because the theory is, well, they're not, they're not trying to monitor stuff. They're just trying to provide an interface and we want people to be on them. You know, news media <clears throat> don't have that. I don't know if there are any analogous uh, differences in the UK. Interesting. I mean, Section 230. So we're kind of familiar with that um, because it forms part of the big debate about why the internet companies have developed as they have. In the UK and in Europe, there's a provision where you can have conditional liability that's based on knowledge. So at least... Right. So practice, someone complains and then you have to respond. But that's... that's a, yeah. Yeah. Um, so differences in um, liability for defamation and liability for other kinds of tort might be part of analyzing this distinction that uh, the questioner has asked about. Okay. And we've got, we haven't got much time. I think we've got about two minutes. Maybe we can check out the, the, the final question here um, from George who writes, you seem to accord a greater role to traditional mainstream media because it's a knowledge institution as such, and it should enjoy a higher level of protection than individuals exercising free speech. Many Southeast Asian countries uh, with highly regulated press rely on online newspapers to act as a fourth estate. Would you say that in such environments, online newspapers and citizen journalism should enjoy the same level of protection as that of mainstream press organizations? So terrific question. I confess I don't know enough about the practices in Southeast Asian countries involving online newspapers to give you a clear answer. When you say online newspapers, though, it makes me think of uh, things uh, like ProPublica, which is an online only, as far as I know. I've never seen a newsletter from them. I think it publishes monthly. Uh, it's an investigative journalism um, organization. They have named people as their leaders. They have reporters, uh, and they do, you know, often very good, very interesting work. And they're an online presence, an online journalistic uh, venture. Uh, and so, I, again, I don't know the online newspapers in Southeast Asia. And the challenges of being, and I want to just say that the challenges of functioning as a, a press in, in, a, in a country, and I don't know if any of, the, any of the countries would fit this, that is not a working constitutional democracy may be quite different. Uh, and one would need to take that into account. But if the online newspapers that you're referring to are analogous to the online digital newspapers that I've seen in the US, I would think those would be knowledge institutions. They're ongoing. They have a goal of, of reporting truth. They follow journalistic verification and independence approaches, um, whereas citizen journalists may not. But there may be environments where the best sources of knowledge will come from citizens. And so I wanna just bracket those and say, we need to think a little separately about them. Okay, but it's really not the, the format of the media, it's more the, the organization. So is it a group of people? Does it have the process and so on rather than is it in a print form or is it, yeah, absolutely. Okay, right, I think we are now at an hour and a half there. Um, and thanks for persevering with the cold there as well. Um, I should bring things to a close and finish just by thanking everyone at the Bonavero Institute for organizing the lecture. If you want to find out about um, 
future events. I think I put a link there in the chat. You can check that out or check out the website. Um, thanks to everyone for attending and for all of the questions. And finally, thank, a big thanks to Professor Vicky Jackson for sharing her insights about the role of the media and the important contribution to debates on media freedom. And finally, for those of you that are participating in the Price Moot Court, I'd like to wish you good luck in the forthcoming rounds. Thank you.